and the, the sort of influence of you know the the sort of Scandinavians coming in Sa Anglo Saxons and you know the Danes um, and obviously the Scots the, the sort of the, the Irish as well I'm sure there was some, some some Welsh as well in there at some point. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel and I hope you're well and if you're new here, you're welcome. My name is Gloria and today I have my husband with me. Hello. So today we will be looking at a video about how England was formed. I really love history. As some of you can tell, I have some reaction videos about history and I believe it's, you know, it's a learning curve for us to learn our history or know the history of maybe where we live or the people we interact with and you know just keep learning every day yeah absolutely. and you are very good with history aren't you well don't oversell me so um, i'm hoping i know a thing or two <laughs> yeah. i'm okay i'm hoping you can you know further educate me to what this video has got to say today sure sure <laughs> well it'll be interesting to see what the video has to say because i don't know it all so it'll be quite nice to see yeah so we're going to be looking at this video how england was formed i'm really quite intrigued and i really want to know and yes and if you're excited as well and you know want to know how england was formed then keep watching anyway without further ado let's jump right into this video is one that is often taken for granted and looked at far too scarcely this may be due to the overshadowing history of the development of Great Britain and the United Kingdom. But nonetheless, in order for these unions to be formed, England had to already exist, and it actually has since 927 AD. So how was England created? Who claimed the land before the English, and how did it become the nation that we know today? As the Roman Empire began to fade from the British Isles, the area of modern-day England started to see a wave of migration from Anglo-Saxon Germanic tribes. According to some historians, after the Romans left, the native Britons came under attack from the nearby Picts and Scots and some of these Anglo-Saxons in hopes that they would push out the other invaders. The Germanic peoples were invasion. successful in expelling <laughs> both the Scots and Picts, but they then turned on the native Britons and established their own authority by the start of the 7th century. The new Anglo-Saxon rulers then installed the kingdoms of Essex, Kent, Sussex, Mercia, East Anglia, Northumbria, and Wessex on the British mainland. There are minimal records of what happened over the next few centuries throughout these kingdoms, but we do know that it wouldn't be long before the Anglo-Saxons would face invaders of their own. In 793, a Viking army landed at the Lindisfarne Monastery and raided the sacred building. Their violence and disrespect stunned the Anglo-Saxons, who were unprepared for what these Vikings had in store. By the end of 870, East Anglia fell to the Danish invaders, and Mercia was lost only four years later. As the Vikings seized Northumbria next in 875, Wessex was the only remaining major kingdom under Anglo-Saxon authority. When the current king of Wessex, Ethelred, died, his younger brother, Alfred, was left to protect his kingdom's independence. At first, he did so by paying off the Viking aggressors, until he was eventually prepared to lead an army against them. This culminated in the Battle of Eddington, which left the Danes utterly routed and ended their attempts to capture Wessex. A power vacuum in Mercia around the same time resulted in King Alfred also gaining control of the kingdom, and instead of establishing a new monarch, he placed an alderman in charge. This nobleman would answer to King Alfred himself and kept the King of Wessex as the ultimate authority throughout both regions, although a part of Mercia would be ceded to the Vikings. After the death of the King of Wessex and the contemporary leader of Mercia in 911, Edward the Elder and Ethelfled each became the respective successors. Together, these new rulers began to increase the pressure that had already been put on the neighboring Danelaw. In 917, 
Ethelflaed expanded her lands to the north, and Edward was able to incorporate all of East Anglia into his kingdom. As Ethelflaed pushed forward with the expansion, she managed to extend Mercian territory all the way up to York, where the locals decided it would be best to simply pledge loyalty to her as opposed to fighting. Although Ethelflaed shortly died, her daughter, Elfwyn, was supposed to take her place and continue on the current course. Unexpectedly, though, the Mercian people quickly ousted their new leader and accidentally created the perfect opportunity for King Edward from Wessex to seize all of Mercia not long after. In 918, the Anglo-Saxons continued farther into Danelaw territory and slowly gained more and more land for themselves. By the time of Edward's death in 924, the newly acquired neighbors of the Anglo-Saxons had all pledged allegiance to the king. This put the Anglo-Saxons in a confident position as Edward's son, Ethelstan, took over the kingdom. Around this time, Ethelton's sister would marry the local Viking ruler, Citric, who still controlled Northumbria. Ethelstan marched on and was finally able to bring the Kingdom of York under his crown as his sister's husband passed away. This left Northumbria up for grabs and the king swiftly consolidated it as part of his kingdom. This is generally the time that most historians view the Kingdom of England as having been created. But the situation was not exactly so simple. Ethelstan was not done trying to expand his kingdom however he could, and although he did term himself the King of the English at this point, mm. it was still not quite what we know as England today. Ethelstan decided to give an invasion of Scotland a chance to see if he could reach his authority even further. The Kingdom of Scotland, or as it was known at the time, Alaba, was at a disadvantage against the English, and therefore appealed to the other remaining sovereign states for assistance. This prompted an alliance between Constantine II, King of Alaba, Olaf Guthrison, King of Dublin, and Owain, King of Strathclyde. With King Olaf at the helm, the Alliance faced the English at the spectacular Battle of Brunnenburg. Though it is unknown exactly where this battle took place, it is certain that the Alliance was severely crushed by the English invaders. The casualties on both sides was disastrously high, but Ethelstan and the English were without a doubt the victors. It's believed by many that this clash may have truly solidified the unity of England and stirred up a new sense of nationalism and pride amongst the English people. Nonetheless, it didn't result in the incorporation of Alaba nor Strathclyde into the Kingdom of England, as both stayed independent. England, on the other hand, would have to prove its ability to do so. The Vikings, though temporarily defeated, would return to the Young Kingdom at the end of the 10th century. After Ethelstan's death in 939, the previously defeated King of Dublin, who was a Viking ruler, took immediate advantage of England's temporary instability. While King Ethelstan's brother Edmund took over the English realm, King Olaf swooped in to reconquer some of the lands that had once been in Viking hands. York was quickly captured and a large chunk of what used to be Northumbria and Mercia was also taken, as he strong-armed the English into accepting this annexation. Ironically, when Olaf died in 941 and his cousin, who shared the same name, was transitioning to the throne as his successor, Edmund of England jumped on the chance to pay the Vikings back for the invasion. The following year, the middle chunk of annexed land was retaken by the English, and in only two more years, the Vikings were entirely pushed out of Northumbria. This essentially reunited England, since the territory was now all under Edmund's control. As ambitious as his ancestors, Edmund next invaded Strathclyde, but only took some of its southern territories by the end of the incursion. The rest was given to King Malcolm I of Scotland, as opposed to joining England. It once again appeared as though the Kingdom of England had established some stability. But this was once more short-lived. Edmund was mysteriously murdered in 946, which left his younger brother, Edred, as King of England. The next year, Eric Bloodaxe from Norway attacked and seized the recently reincorporated Northumbria, which prompted almost a decade of conflicts over who throughout the Isles would lead Northumbria. Eventually, the English king was able to once again and permanently 
reclaim the territory on behalf of England. His death soon ended his reign after this victory, and his young nephew, Edwig, temporarily succeeded him, but was quickly deposed in favor of his brother, Edgar. However, this was only a partial deposition, which meant that Edwig would still hold a small section of the kingdom as a co-ruler. When Edwig died only two years after this decision, Edgar simply took over the whole of England. Under the reign of King Edgar, known as Edgar the Peaceful, the true foundations of the English kingdom could finally be established. Many reforms were passed, and a vast number of the systems and laws that had existed in the Dane law were actually upheld in hopes of avoiding any displeasure from the Danish portion of the population. Peace, unity, and order were the pillars of Edgar's nearly two decade long reign, and his work helps to fully solidify the unity of the young Kingdom of England. The ultimate foundation of England was a long and shaky process, from the initial immigration of the Anglo-Saxons into the region to the establishment of their first kingdoms, extending into the invasion and rule of the Vikings. It wasn't until the Anglo-Saxons began to seize territory from the Danelov that an inkling of modern-day England could be seen. After a series of conquering, being conquered, reconquering, and so on, the Anglo-Saxons eventually united the existing kingdoms throughout England. From there, it was merely a matter of establishing solid borders, maintaining their captured territory in order to keep their kingdom physically solid, and eventually, under the rule of Edgar the Peaceful, building the foundational laws and structures of what we know now as the kingdom or nation of England. Wow. Yeah, it's sort of Conquering, interesting to see how it sort of evolved over the years and the, the sort of influence of, you know, the, the sort of Scandinavians coming in, Anglo-Saxons and, you know, the Danes um, and obviously the Scots, the, the sort of the, the Irish as well. I'm sure there was some, some, some Welsh as well in there at some point. Um, so it's sort of interesting to see how, how that, how it all sort of evolved over the years and it, it, it sort of got me thinking about the sort of the English language. Yeah, I was you know, just going to say that. So how, how, how that, did it how come that about? sort of evolved as well. It must have evolved from all this sort of, you know, Anglo-Saxons uh, amalgamation of all these different cultures. So yeah, definitely. It's not just um, um, sort of uh, one type of language, I suppose. It's, it's sort of a, a, a sort of, that's why we have, we borrow languages from all different, so you know, we've got some words that are French, yeah, some words yeah. that are German, a little some bit words here and there exactly, to form yeah. the English language. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's, a, it's like a, a, a blend pot, really, yeah, it's of a blend of all these different cultures. Cultures. Yeah, interesting. Edward the yeah. Peaceful, he did great, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did well, he did well. Edward the Peaceful. Yeah, that was an interesting um, video. Um, yeah, I learned a lot there. Because at the, at the start, I was a bit like, all oh, these things, and what's going on? I was a bit confused. A but as we got natives. into it, <laughs> <laughs> yes, true. Yeah. As we got into it, I, I began to understand, you know, well, what was going on and all the history of in, um, in how England was formed. Anyway, yeah. guys, I hope you enjoyed watching this video and learning about how England was formed. Because, of course, I did. Definitely, mm -hmm. I yeah. did. Because yeah. I learned something new today. Sure. And yes, and if you're here to subscribe, what are you waiting for? Please smash that subscribe button and like this video if you do. And until our next one. No? Until my next one. <laughs> until our next one. Stay safe, guys. Bye. Bye.